Heavenly Father, thank you for this quarter that we've been considering the cosmic conflict, the great controversy narrative. And as we look at the role of the disciples whom you have called to be part of that conflict between good and evil, between Jesus and Satan, may we truly take the side of the winner and be able to proclaim his victory to more people that they too by faith can gain that victory in Jesus Christ. Uh, make us teachable, and we pray that the Spirit will pervade their discussion, that we might come out of this study more strengthened and edified for your service and your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Alright, so we come into the great controversy, and in this particular case, the quarterly uses a a, a very interesting word. It's uh, comrades. You know what the comrade is, right? When you talk, talk about comrade, you start talking military terms. In other words, when there is a conflict and there's a battle, you talk of armies, right? So there's got to be armies. And there, are, there, there always has been two dimensions in the great controversy, right? We have the heavenly dimension and the earthly dimension okay let's just contextualize this in the heavenly dimension when the when the cosmic conflict erupted and it started the great controversy started were there armies in heaven yes yes there are armies uh, what what were the two armies in heaven followers of satan and followers of god armies well, of no, lucifer uh, armies of satan there okay then armies of who? Who was on the other side? Michael, Michael and his angels. We, we know that. So we started that. They, they started colliding with each other in heaven. Michael and his angels prevailed. They kicked Lucifer out of heaven. And Lucifer became Satan. That's why we said... Lucifer, the angels, the angels who fell in heaven were demonized. What does that mean? They were turned into demons and they were turned into Satan. He, Lucifer stayed to Satan. All the armies of Satan were turned into demons. How did it come to that thing? Well, we don't know a whole lot. The Bible says that because Satan rebelled. God, God created them perfect. Okay. No, no, nothing. Okay. And yet, okay. sin over them. All right. See, you, you, you forgot our, our initial study, guys. In the great controversy, there's one possibility to happen, because God is a God of love. He wants to maintain a loving relationship. What makes love possible? Can, love, can God force us to love Him? If He forces us to love Him, that's not love. That's what we call rape. Okay? No, so in order... I'm, I'm answering your question, guys. Okay. So, in order for us to love God, we must be free to love Him, not forced. So now you come to a word called free. You need freedom. So we were given... Freedom to choose. We are free but moral heaven, agents. In heaven, there's no such thing like that. What do you mean? There was. Uh, how can that. you how can you have a relationship if you have no choice? If you have no choice, you will be dealing with robots and automatons. And that well, is not the government are, of God. They are, they are perfectly perfect. No, oh, yeah. no nothing. Sure. I mean, sure, but if a perfect individual is given the choice. We don't have any perfect individual around here. I'm not talking about you. We're still in heaven, Cash. Don't go to it. We will go there, okay? In heaven, everything was perfect. But when you were in heaven and you were given a choice, is it possible for you to choose that which is evil? How did they give them a choice? Answer my question, Cash. If you're given a choice, can you choose evil? If you cannot, you don't have a choice. Because they don't, they don't know evil before. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. If you cannot choose evil, then you have no choice. And then you will be forced, and then you'll be a robot, and you just malign the character of God. God is not a God so that what forces us. To the evil thing in there? Well, because they chose not to worship God, and that's evil. Anything that goes against God is evil. 
Okay, where did it come from? We do not know. We are told that if you explain where it came from, you will justify it. So we are not justifying it. We're not explaining it. All I'm saying is it happened because God wants us to have a free, loving decision to love Him back, not a forced love from us. It must be a free, a heart obedience, a heart of worship given to Him. So why did it happen? Because Lucifer was given a choice. So the, the next question we have was because Lucifer fell in the heavenly conflict, where was he cast out? Yes. He was cast out to the earth. Let's review this, okay? Yes, he was thrown to the earth. That's why... Did, did, did he was in the earth. All right, so how do you... Excuse me. Did he cast in every, uh, what I mean, some planet before... Okay. Before I thought you didn't have questions this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> the Bible is very clear. Cast to the earth. Uh, we do not have explicit evidence, but if you read Job, where the heavenly beings gathered before God, that suggests well, that that's the earth already. No, no, no. The earth already. No, the you read Job. It was in heaven that they had this council. Remember, jo Satan was talking to God because there was a session in heaven. Yeah, but but Satan was here before. Yeah. Because how how can he knows uh, Job? Okay, he, well, he don't, don't jump there yet. So, uh, we, we process this. We, let, let have some common sense here, okay, <laughs> to understand this. The first thing is, your question is, is, are there possibility, is there a possibility that, that there are inhabitants in other planets? The Bible doesn't they say that explicitly, but Job tells you people, yeah, there were creatures gathered in front of God to report to God what was going on. And evidently, Satan represented what? Earth. He represented earth. Also, if Satan represented earth, the other creatures before God must have represented other planets. Okay? That's the implication. Outside of that, we don't have any biblical direct evidence. That there. So since the Bible is not silent, I will not speculate on that. Is it possible? I will tell you. I'll grant you. You will read early writings. Ellen White says that there are other planets. There were other Adams and Eves. But that's not in the Bible. So I want to stay, I want to stay around there. I will stay out of there because... The Bible basically says this scripture and this gospel is meant for lost mankind. Okay? That's the reason why we need to have the earthly dimension. Okay? So if we can bear with me, we haven't left the heavenly dimension yet. Okay? We're here. So so Satan and Lucifer was Satanized and he was demonized. They were turned into demons. And they were cast into the earth. Okay? When they were cast into the earth, what is proof that they were cast into the earth? Remember Genesis 1. What did we study? The beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And what's the next verse? The earth and the gone. earth was without form and void. And, void. and, and darkness. darkness was upon the face of, of the, the deep. deep. How can God create something that's void with no, void darkness? It means void of life. So that means <coughs> that he had he had, he had actually created the earth and the universe before that? Yeah. I mean, but it says in, uh, uh, as you go along in chapter, uh, uh. he's talking about what comes what next and next yes. and next. Yes. So I, I, okay, I, the answer there, there is, this God created time. That's right. There was no days until the first day was done. So the concept of time, that's why we're dealing with the dimension of God here. I mean, this is beyond us, okay? So, uh, the only way we can understand things is the, what they call a space-time continuum. We got to measure things in terms of time, you know, which is never-ending, and in terms of space. That, that's why I see you, I got my five, per, five senses, I can perceive you, that's space. The physical space and time, chronology. Uh, and who, invent, who, who created that? God created time and God created space. But it's amazing that before the first day, before God said, let there be light, there was darkness. Really, the original languages suggest that there was chaos after God created the heaven and the earth. Why, why was there chaos? A lot of Bible teachers suggest because Satan was thrown into this earth, he created the chaos. Okay? So before, chaos is natural. Before, before the man in this earth, is Satan in here first. Yeah. Before there was life. Yes. It was right there. In fact, how, how did the snake show up when Eve was around? 
So he was yes. already here. He was permitted. But I mean, he's permitted. slick. He's slick in the sense that he can take several forms. Okay, he is a spirit, but he can take a physical form. And he took the, the form of the most beautiful animal in the garden. Right? So the point is, Benji, you're right. It's natural for us to create chaos. It is not natural for God to create chaos. When God creates, He creates everything that He creates is good. After He finished. Well. But before He finished, when the things that He created were cooling down, to create a planet, it has to cool down. Okay. Now you're talking. No, no, you're talking space-time continuum. You're not space. You're not talking with the dimension of God. When God said. Out of the words of God, you know, ex nihilo, from nothing. He said, let there be heavens and earth. He created the heavens and the earth. As soon as it, the heavens and the earth are there, will the heavens and earth be good? Yes, they're creations of God. Why was it void? Why was there chaos? Because some, somebody created chaos. So the suggestion is when Lucifer was cast down to earth, he messed up what God originally created. Okay? This is where the controversy begins on earth. The creation story is finished. Adam and Eve is created. Mankind was created. What happened to Adam and Eve when they were created? They were given the power of choice as well. How in the world can Eve and Adam sin when in fact they were created perfect, right? That was the question. They said, well, again, they had the power of choice. They chose to violate God. There was one big difference, and that's why the enemy, the devil, is so mad at the church. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, they were not demonized, they were not bestialized. What's the meaning of that? They were not turned into beasts, they were not turned into demons. They were kept men and women. They were kept human beings. Question! Why were they not demonized? Okay, that's so for one of the one, 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 of, one of at least two reasons. They were made in the image of God. Uh, Satan is not. He was not created in the image of God. Lucifer. Oh yeah. Yeah. Lucifer was a created angel, and uh, he was not created in the image of God because I will, the suggestion is. One of the traits of the image of God is communion. Why is, it, why is it possible for God to commune with Himself? Because there are three persons in the Godhead. Okay? Why? Because God has the ability to create. Do angels have the ability to create? No. They don't. Okay? So that's they, that's they don't even have the, the ability to procreate. Okay, but can men procreate? Yes. yes, to a certain extent, through the mechanism that God engineered within man, we are able to reproduce. In fact, one of the one of the mandates in Genesis is what: go, therefore, multiply, replenish the earth. Therefore, you are able to procreate. Yes, Ellen White suggests that we, this could be one of the reasons why. Lucifer got so jealous. Number one, he wasn't given the capability of procreation. And number two, he was not included in the planning of the creation of men in the image of God. Again, there's no explicit evidence for that. The bottom line is when it reached earth, men chose to disobey God. And because he was created in God's image, okay, since he was created in God's image, God wanted to restore His image in man. So we come with the first announcement of that restoration, which is in Genesis 3.15. Remember? And what is Genesis 3.15? Proto-Evangelium. What is Proto-Evangelium? Proto is the first, the basically called prototype, the first gospel declaration. What is the promise in Genesis 3.15? Everybody knows this. You'll put enmity between... The serpent, the seed of the woman. Again, you know, this is the promised seed. So, Cleo's right. We were not demonized because, what? Because we were made in the image of God. But there was one other important reason why we were not demonized. We were not demonized because Jesus will be coming 
through the lineage of the human race. So that's why Satan, uh, uh, Lucifer, become demonized because he is not God created. No, and that's the, the no. We we don't know if that's the reason. All we're saying is when he sinned, God turned him into Satan, and all of his minions became demons. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were not turned into demons. They remained sinful yeah, because, human beings. Because you said the, the man is, crea uh, is created in the image of God. Not only that. Not only that. The, Satan, not, Satan is not. Yeah. Not only that. Created if, in the image of God. That's why. Not, he, yeah. Okay. Well. So yes, we can speculate there, but but there's not a whole lot of biblical evidence. Let's not go there. Let's go to Earth because that's where the Bible says. Why did God not turn Adam and Eve to demons? Because if He does, if He did, there will be no Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will not come. Yeah. From, from the promise to the fulfillment in mm. Galatian, at least how many years? How long? I don't know. I mean, they're saying 4,000 4, years before Jesus Christ, uh, Bishop Asher, but they, a lot of guys question that. Some so it's around 4,000 years? Well, some people now say it's about 10,000. We don't know. What Bishop Asher did was he, he counted the, the genealogies in the, the Bible. Unfortunately, the, some of the genealogies have breaks in between them. Okay? We don't know exactly. But it's not really important how many, how many years there was. According to God, there was a set time for Jesus to become man. Okay? And there's a set time for Jesus to come back the second time. The bottom line is the great controversy rages even on earth. Why? Because Jesus sent his son. We studied the two lessons ago in order for the son to engage the enemy in battle on earth. He engaged the enemy in the battle up here. Now he engages the enemy in, in the battle here on earth. The difference is that when they battled in heaven, it was a battle of worship of the angels. Now when they engaged in battle on earth, it is now the battle between the enemy making human beings sinners and God trying to redeem mankind from sin. By the way, where, where is that great controversy come from? From the first lesson of the quarter. How did it be? How did, uh, Revelation 13. There was war in heaven. Michael and, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and Satan, you know, <laughs> Satan fought Just and Michael this. prevailed. Okay? That's what the Bible says. Now, if you want to question the Bible, you can question it, guys. But the Bible says it started in heaven. There was a war between heaven. Now, Revelation 13 does not necessarily say what happened. You go to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. There's a suggestion that because of the pride of Lucifer, he wanted to be like God. He was cast out of heaven. Okay? And all this whole plan of God should be great mm -hmm. controversy. If, if Adam and me didn't sin in the, mm -hmm. in the garden, and all this wouldn't happen, let's just say we'd all be in heaven, but would we really know the great mercy and love and, and, and kindness of God and Jesus? Uh, because well, it's already there, you know yeah. what I mean? He gave this it is, to us. John there. MacArthur had an excellent sermon in this. You know, I just yeah, I, he, 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 he preached in Romans 5. You know Romans 5, the first and second Adam? Yeah. It's, he keeps on saying, the, the expression in Romans is, how much more since yeah. one man sinned and because of one man death came to all men. You know, all this, all this cursing. Yeah. How much more will grace come? How much more will justification come? Yes, that's true. If Adam and Eve did not sin, we would have not seen the great mercy of God in Jesus Christ. I think that's kind of a very important so this, part this of God's will, God. will be crowded. Okay, well, well, crowded, yeah. Yeah, overcrowded, yeah. Overcrowded. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's, we are, we are dealing with so much ideas here. Let's just, oh, yeah. we will go back here. We will go back to what you say first, okay? If Adam and Eve did not sin, this would have been populated by people who are not sinners. And... And God will probably uproot the knowledge of the tree of good and evil because there was no need. When, when the testing is over, you don't need the test anymore. But we sin. And if, if, you, if you believe the... We cannot, we cannot monk uh, the, the, test is, the test is over when you have been confirmed that you're faithful to God. But that will be a, a continual thing to all our whole eternity to be... No. When it cannot be because where Adam failed, Jesus 
But no, one. Gene, I know I understand that, but if we, if 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 Adam and Eve never never sinned. Okay, when I mean, yeah. it would just be a continual. Yeah, there, there, there. Well, th th that's why the implication is this. It says, on the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. Okay? That's one sign. Yeah. What if they don't eat? Don't it, will, eat. It, will not be, it will not be an unending testing. There will be a probationary period that says, I'll give you a, a probationary period. Okay? If you fail during that probationary period, the testing period, you will die. That's what the Bible says. But since you can fail in the testing period, can you also succeed? You failed already, no. Of course not. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we, we have, let's, let's, if you fail, you will die. But since you can fail in the testing period, can you also succeed? Yes. Yes, you can succeed. But that success is within the purview of the testing period. You will be confirmed. Somehow, when you complete the testing period, you will be confirmed in God and you will be given your reward, you, your reward of eternal life. Okay? Because they had conditional immortality. We talk about that when, when, okay. when we started the thing. It will no longer be conditional because you fulfilled the condition. How do I know that? Because when Jesus came as a second Adam, did he fulfill the condition? Yes, he did. He did not have to obey for eternity. He only went three and a half years. I'm not saying three and a half years is the, is the testing period. But uh, Jesus went through the same testing period of Adam and he prevailed. He did not sin. And because he prevailed, what happened? He was given... A reward. What was given to Jesus? Given eternal life and perfect righteousness. Nothing what did Jesus say? Power over the earth. Yes, and what did Jesus say? I don't need eternal life. I do not need perfect righteousness because I am already perfect. I am already eternal as the Son of God. So you know what I'm going to do? He said, I will give eternal life and perfect righteousness to anyone who will believe in me. That was the gospel. Okay? So, that's why that's a marvelous exchange. Where Adam fell, Jesus succeeded. But remember, he failed the test. Jesus succeeded the test. So the test is not unlimited. There is a finite set of time where you need to pass the test. And Jesus passed the test. Because the, there is the difference between the first Adam and the second Adam. Yes, you read that in Romans 5, 12 to 21. The difference is there. But <coughs> Terry brings up a good point. That after we covered your first question, what if Adam and Eve did not sin? Okay, I'm not a very big fan of what ifs. Okay, <laughs> but uh, this is maybe become speculating. But what if Adam and Eve did not sin? If Adam and Eve did not sin, we would have not tasted the grace of God in Jesus Christ. So that's the plan, really. That's why Romans five says, "How much more." Uh, that's why in Revelation, it starts by the, the four living creatures and the 24 elders bowing because God is greater. That's Revelation yes, 4. When we go to heaven, we'll be bound on... Uh, all the time. No, no, all the time, but we'll be bound on for the Christ. He is our Savior. Yes, uh -huh. and that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, Revelation starts with creation as the foundational reason for worship. Yes. And then comes the seals. Yeah, there were there there were the seals for the scrolls. No one could open the scroll. And what? One came. Like a lamb slain. And then all of a sudden they say, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Now the basis of worship from then on is the blood of Jesus or the blood of the Lamb. In other words, from creation, the basis of worship became redemption. Now here's the question. If because God is creator, men and the angels should worship him. How much more should men worship God because of the redemption that he has wrought in Jesus Christ? That's how great it is. When you talk about worship, did they have reason to worship in heaven? Yes, because God is almighty. God is in omnipotent. God is uh, uh, no, he's he's infinite. He's eternal. He's glorious. When they failed, they did not do that. Now come to the earth. Do men have reason to worship God? Yes, because God is still their creator. But how much more will they have reason to worship Him because God sent His Son to save us from our sins? That's very profound. The, the, the reason for the great controversy on earth is the redemption of the Lamb that was slain since the but foundation God of the world. How much Jesus, more? we have no excuse. That's exactly the point. I mean, I mean, God already... I mean, if God as a Creator demands your worship, how much more should He demand our worship when He sent His own Son to die for us 
to redeem us and we reject him. That's why what the Hebrews says, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And, and then, then the, the parable of Jesus is, remember those tenants? He started killing all the, the servants of the king. And when the king sent his own son, they killed his son. The question of Jesus is, what do you think the king will do to all those tenants? He's going to beat them up. Because when you get lost in the end, remember, you will not get lost because you've done bad things. Why will you get lost? You'll get lost because you've rejected Jesus Christ. So when where will be God in that position when God gave Jesus the whole the whole uh, what you can what the power you say, the whole power mm -hmm. of, uh, of him mm -hmm. to Jesus right. so where will be uh, God is Jesus God yes yeah. okay so God's there no what I mean yeah I know okay. Jesus, right. God, uh, Jesus is there but where will be the God Jesus God is God, God so there. God's there yeah Jesus is God therefore God's there right yeah, what I, mean, what I mean. So you answered your so, own question. So God the Father yeah. will be on the side set away? No, so you're talking, no, you're separating the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son. You cannot separate them. That's another mystery. God has three persons. Okay? That's why John 3.16 has all persons of the God that moving. Who gave the Son? The Father. If God did not, if the Father did not give the Son, will we have a Savior? No. no. Okay. That whosoever believeth in Him, who makes people believe? Who gives them the power to believe? The Holy Spirit. No, right? The, the big mystery, the biggest mystery mm -hmm. is who is the mother? Where is the father? There's a son, <laughs> father, <laughs> Holy Spirit, where is the mother? You know, <laughs> the, the, the people watching mystery. this video is, is really having a lot of fun here. Okay. Yeah. That's the biggest mystery. Man. No, you do not. Where is the mother? Why, why this, do you really need the... Uh, a mother to have a creature is uh, probably uh, is, is okay. And here's the problem. Here's the problem, Benji. The problem is we were, we are not trying to fit God into our mold, when in fact we are only reflecting God's image. God's image says, "I have a relationship. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a relationship. So they commune with each other. So I want to create men so they can have a relationship with me as well." Okay, but we cannot be God, Father, and Holy Spirit. What are we? We're men and woman, and the man and woman is a relationship that reflects the image of God. That's why the, they, they're saying that the love of God is most profoundly reflected between the love between the man and the woman, right? What God has put together, let no man put the sun. You, you, always, you always say that. In other words, how, what, what makes that the man and woman able to procreate? They're separate gonads. Yes, okay, if you want to be very scientific about this, because we have reproductive organs, and those reproductive organs were given to us by God so we can reproduce. Right. Does God need reproduction organs in order to create? No, we are only a reflection of the image of God. God creates ex nihilo from nothing. So you don't, God doesn't, God the Father doesn't need a mother in order to have a son. God is eternal. Okay. So he just created it. Yeah. And, and it, let's be very careful not to apply our, our human terms to divine terms because we're only a reflection of what God is. Okay? In fact, I, want, I don't want to complicate this issue so that we can go to the lesson now. In fact, when you go to heaven, there will be no marriage in heaven, right? There will be like the angels, sexless. Okay, well, we will... Have none. So this, that's why. Have none, okay, just one more thing, and we'll go to the last one. Man, I did a long intro. <laughs> 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 the, 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 sorry. Um, that's why they 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 talk about the nephilim. You got heard? You guys heard about the nephilim, right? Yeah. The nephilim is the. A lot of people still believe the nephilims were the products of the angels. Cohabitating with, Hercules, with, with, with Hercules. yeah, the Titans. Okay, <laughs> uh, there's some there's the theories about the aliens. You, you go to YouTube and Google, you can find a lot. They're saying Nephilim are roaming know, there uh, today. I got a, I got a, a more question, one more question. Probably this is a stupid question, though. No? Man, <laughs> but, uh, is angels no sex organs? No, no. They, How do you know that? They're him. Okay. Let us repeat what Jesus said. I will. No, then. they are not. Uh, they cannot uh, reproduce. No more. Yes. That yeah, is taken away. Why are you able? <laughs> why are you able? Why are you unable to reproduce? Because you don't have an organ to reproduce. Right? I don't know. We don't know. I'm telling you the reason why you cannot produce. That's why 
male were castrated in the Old Testament for them not to... Well, in, in the Jews. Uh, yes, to inca no, not, not in the Jews. They were castrated in order to worship Baal and the heathen gods in the Old Testament. Remember if you listen to the lesson study? Yeah, but it's in heaven. In heaven, what I'm talking about is in heaven. In heaven, you will be like the angels, says Jesus. Yeah. When you become like the angels, you do not marry and give into marriage. It's what so he there's, said. There's no more. There is no more marriage. There is no male and female. Okay. We'll be All right. Okay. Now, now, Cass is smiling. Okay. And Cass is laughing. God forbid that sex is so important for you. You will <laughs> hate heaven because you don't have sex in heaven. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's very blunt. Point. Okay. That's, that's our question only. Yes. What well, is the question too? Remember, they they wanted to trap Jesus because of the liberal right custom, right? When the brother dies, the brother should take over, and then he, and eventually this 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 woman had so many husbands from the same family. By the time he, he she gets to heaven, the question was, whose wife would she be? And what was the answer, of Jesus? The answer, of Jesus was. You don't understand the scriptures. When you go to heaven, you'll be like the angels, and you will not marry, not give into marriage. Okay, that's a euphemism for you will have no sex in heaven. And by sex, I mean there's no female or female. Neither will you have a sexual act. You don't oh, yeah. need it anymore. Is that, is that in the Bible? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right you, you read that, that the conversation. I mean, that's, everybody sure. knows that, that trap, okay? Let me just it point this out. Because the great controversy is about worship, and one of the most, intimate and the most exhilarating gift that God has given to men is the gift of sex. In fact, the act of procreation is a product of the most intimate and the most exhilarating experience that men can have on earth as the creatures of God. <coughs> sex is holy, okay? We only, we only corrupted sex as, as, as human race, but sex is holy. You do that within the bounds of marriage properly, it will be a holy thing. But what happened? Basically, the fact that we messed up with sex. Um, Too much hormones. Now the, the, point, the, point I'm driving at, the point I'm driving at is the Nephilim. They're saying Nephilim was the angels trying to go and go upon women, women, women of the human race to have a sexual relationship with them. So the argument there... How can angels have a sexual relationship with women when they don't have sex? They they don't have male female. Because okay? before they were taken off from that ability. All right. So there, there there's three possible answers there. Man, we're really doing a tangent here. The first, the the one of the the attractive alternatives is that what happened was the demons possess men, and while they were possessed, they impregnated the woman. And the product of this impregnation were the Nephilim. Okay? There's no telling what somebody can do under the possession of the devil. If you're possessed by the enemy of a demon, you, you know how the, 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 the demoniacs at Gadara, the gathering demoniacs, they were so strong. Nobody could hold them. Don't be, so you become very strong. You're possessed by the, an evil spirit. And imagine if you're possessed by an <coughs> evil spirit, and you cohabitate with a human, a, a human being, a fellow human being. What's going to happen? You will have, a, you will have a mutt, something strange, an aberration will come out of that union. That's, That's what they're saying. The reason why Sodom and Gomorrah, I didn't, I didn't cover that in my sermon. Some people are suggesting the reason why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God was this men in Sodom did not only want to have relationship with the guest with men. They knew, for some reason, they knew that they were special beings. That's why the New Testament called them, calls them strange flesh. In other words, they have an idea that they were angels. What did the, what did the men in Sodom want to do? They wanted to have relationship with angels. You know what you're doing there? You're messing up the equilibrium here. You're taking the controversy here. And God decided, said, no, no, I will not allow men to be demonized because the seed will come. Why is Satan trying to destroy the lineage of Jesus Christ? Because he doesn't want for Jesus to come. That's the great controversy. Satan is saying, if I can deter the birth of the seed of the woman, I will win the battle, right? 
And how do I do it? I will mess up the genes and I will mess up the DNA. I will introduce this thing and there's going to be so much aberrations. Jesus cannot come as a man, as a human being, as a man. He cannot say man anymore because he's going to be totally man. Okay. Now, when Jesus was born, what happened? What did Herod try to do? They tried to kill all the babies. Was Satan all the way there trying to prevent the birth of Jesus? Yes, he was trying to prevent them. Why? Because it is not only a historical birth. It is a birth within the context of the great controversy. You can't understand it. And as long as you keep on hammering on these people, your class will understand that you're talking about the cosmic conflict. We're talking about Jesus saving men and being born. It is not just Jesus being born first Christmas. Jesus is being born so that he can win the battle in the great controversy. Why is Satan so afraid? Because he knows that if God takes the form of man and Jesus is born, will have any chance to win? Oh, it's going to be very difficult. In fact, he tried to destroy Jesus and he thought he won when Jesus died on the cross. Turned out he lost because Jesus needed, needed to die in order to live. Okay? So we have... The, the Nephilim were destroyed in this earth during the flood of Noah. Only the family of Noah mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. saved because there was no Nephilim bloodlines. Exactly. And that's one of the arguments that says the Nephilim, it's people, people believe that the Nephilims were actually the, the descendant of Seth who apostatized. No, okay. Seth. Well, they, they, Seth they, was uh, you know, a righteous man. Yeah, but I mean, some, some, they're saying that some of the descendants, some of the, yeah, the, 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 the descendants of Seth commingled the descendants of Cain. That's why instead of angels and women, the what they call the chosen the chosen line which is set commingled with Cain okay but uh, th those those are all possible those are all possibilities the bottom line is because there were only eight people saving the flood there were no lines they were pure they, they're saying the line of Noah was pure they were not contaminated by the evil spirits in other words they were not they didn't have an aberration so they were pure so they were and then you read in the land of Canaan that they were Nephilim right in the land of Canaan I promise again these two minutes will be done <laughs> uh, they're saying oh because Satan again attempted to cohabit you know, you know the demons start, I started cohabiting with women on earth again and their Nephilim were produced the line of Goliath and those guys. Okay, I don't want to deal with that. Suffice it to note, the reason why all of this is happening is the enemy is trying to destroy the lineage of the coming seed of the woman. Why? Because if he destroys the descendants of the seed, the seed will never be born and he wins the battle. Okay. Good news. <clears throat> when the time came, as God has promised, was the seed born? Yes, he was. And we studied that two lessons ago Jesus was born and God took the form of a man and took the battle here on earth why did he take the battle on earth because God would love to save fallen mankind one planet out of the billions and billions of galaxies that we have in the universe a tiny speck how does one one preacher say it, the breath of life a speck in the universe that can be destroyed by God with the snap of his finger and the puff of his breath. We can be gone. We are nothing. You ride a spacecraft, you won't even see the earth compared to the size of the sun. And yet why was God so concerned that he took man's place? Because he wants to demonstrate his glorious grace, not only to the earth, but to the whole universe. So that in the end, what does it say? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Really, what, what we're trying to say is see, the earth becomes the platform, the stage of the grace of God. And the whole universe is watching what's going on on earth. And God demonstrates His marvelous, infinite grace in Jesus Christ. So the God of glory who created all of this was loving enough to become a small issue and even die for you. And as soon as this is over, what happens in the end? Every knee will bow. Will that include Satan and his demons? Yes. Will that include angels and all of them? And you read Revelation, millions and thousands upon thousands were bowing to the Lamb that was slain since the foundation of the world. What are we saying then? Why is the earthly dimension important? 
this is the stage where God gave the live demonstration of His grace in Jesus Christ. That is, according to Mayer's, uh, that is the good, the bad, and the ugly. He was thrown down here, and what happened? We participated. Mm. Yeah, but yeah yeah you you will you will then you will then understand finally you will then finally understand our lesson okay why did jesus call disciples and how does that play in the great controversy you know why because on earth if there were armies in heaven there should also be an army on earth right what is the army of of god on earth Jesus, Christians. Church, right? The, true believers. the church and the believers. The, the believers, Christian church. Soldiers. Okay. Who are who, who is on the other side? The world. The world, or the unbelievers? Why is why are they on the other side? Unbelief. Because they have not believed in what Jesus, what God has done in Jesus Christ. So there is an army. There is a whole army of Christ, the commander in the co cosmic conflict on earth. The army of Christ is the church. And the army of the enemy are those outside of the church. Those who do not believe Christ and those who hate God and the world. Okay? How did the church start? That's where our lesson comes in. The church started in the New Testament through the ministry of of 12 apostles and 12 disciples. That's why when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and he was anointed into his earthly ministry, the first thing Jesus did was to call 12 disciples. Why? Because he said, I want to start an army. And this army that I have will fight for me in the great controversy. Follow me carefully. In other words, he will use a band of men to go against the forces of the enemy who's got a band of men themselves. It is interesting that what Christ picked were not an elite army or a special ops force army. They were a bunch of fishermen. They were ordinary people, but God chose them to make a difference for him. That contributes to the greatness of God, right? He can turn something very simple and very weak and turn something very to, and turn that something or someone into some someone very potent and very powerful in his kingdom in fact who were they going against in the new testament they were going against an entire world empire called the roman empire how in the world can a small band of believers go against the what the sophisticated army of rome you know how powerful Rome was? If you read history, the might of Rome was there. But could they destroy the Christians? What did history say? The more they burned the Christians, the more Christians they were. How does Rabbi Zacharias put it? Or I think it was Erwin Luther. They failed to understand the, the principle of, what was the principle of uh, thermodynamics? This is spiritual yes. thermodynamics. Yes. Yes. Heat yes, so when in, in terms of the church, it says, the more heat you apply, the more it expands. In other words, the more Christians you burn, the more Christians there will be. And today, out of a band of 12 disciples who were just fishermen, common men. What is wrong have, before? What's wrong before? I mean, I, I really like your question. Because, <laughs> you, know, you, you know, for yeah, somebody because, who has no questions uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Well, according to the census, there are more Muslims now than Christians. Because, because Rome, Romans, Rome is Christians, what they say. Yeah, that's what they say. Peter. Okay, uh, I invite you, guys. you go to the website of Hinsdale Philam, watch the series on Revelation, that will answer your question, okay? You should remember, uh, the church, a church was under uh, Imperial Rome, and Imperial Rome turned into ecclesiastical Rome or papal Rome, okay? Yeah, and when it became papal Rome from, from a political empire, it became a religious empire and the papal empire, and that papal empire now battles the church, okay? 
And the bottom line is, how can the church prevail? The church can prevail because of these five qualities that he gave to the disciples when they were called. That is the lesson. Okay, we have about 20 minutes to pass us the lesson. And what are the qualities? There are several incidents in the scriptures that we want to go through in order for us to understand the quality. The first quality was the experience of Peter, the calling of the first disciples. And we read in uh, Luke 5.8. Somebody read Luke 5.8. Luke 5.8. Luke 5.8. Luke 5.8. Come on, Terry. Come on, Cass, when pick Simon up your... When Peter saw it, he fell down at, at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. All right, what's the background here? What's the context? Disciples have been fishing all night. They know the territory. They know the lake. They weren't able to catch any fish. And what did Jesus command them to do? Cast, right Cast it on the other side. And when they cast it on the other side, what happened? They caught so much fish, it almost made the boat sink. One of the better and probably one of the best fishermen of the bunch was named Simon. And when he saw the catch of fish because of what Jesus did, what did he say? That's what Terry just said. But get be away from me, for I am a sinful man. The first lesson that was taught to the disciples is contrition. If you want to be part of God's army in the cosmic conflict on earth, you must learn to be contrite. Let me explain that some more. You must learn how to repent and recognize that you're a sinner. You start there. There's no way you can be part of the army if you don't first confess that you're a sinner and you need God. I will always repeat this. You told me, why will people get lost? Because they've rejected Jesus Christ. Why did they reject Jesus Christ? It's very subtle, right? If people no longer sin, no longer call sin by its right name, a lot of people will not know what sin is. So they'll be doing things which they will consider not sin. Are you following me? Since they're not doing any sin, will they ask for forgiveness? Because they will not ask for forgiveness, will they ever be given forgiveness? No. no. You see the very subtle deception of the enemy there? So the first thing Christ taught the disciples is, you realize that you are nothing compared to me. I am God. And before me, you are humble. Before me, you are contrite. Before me, you will worship. And because I am God, when you recognize that, you will recognize that you are not even fit to be before me. It's almost like, um, I was a story. There was a tour group in Europe. And in the tour group, they found the piano. Okay, And then the tour guide said the uh, be careful not to touch the piano because uh, that Beethoven played on the piano. Yeah, you had Ludwig van Beethoven, one of the great musicians. And this lady just sat down there and played. I don't know how to play. I'm a good player. She was, she was even the polished classical pianist. You know what he said? One of the masters of Europe, one of the master pianists of Europe came here to visit. And when he learned that Beethoven played on the piano, he said, I am not even worthy to touch the keyboards of the piano. <laughs> what am I trying to say? If you only know how big God is, you will really know how small you are. That's one of the basic problems of, of before we believe is that we don't know that. Yes. And really, before you know how big God is, you think yourself very big, right? No, uh, we know God is big, but 
still. No, yeah, you know that God is big, but in your mind, cast man says, No, I'm bigger than you. No, I, I, because, no, because, because yeah, God, true. I want to call the shots. You're not calling, you may be big, but I'm bigger. I am yeah, bigger yeah, than you. I won't say that. You don't have to say it, but you can think uh, it and you can act it. Naturally, we want to be me, number one, right? That's the whole point. Right, yeah. To the Buddhists, yeah. there is no such thing as God. Okay. God is not mentioned. In okay. The For now, let's leave the Buddhists okay. alone. Okay. I know that God is more powerful. Okay. It is, it is powerful, but still, uh, I don't. Sometimes I don't do what uh, what you, he what he wants me to do. Yeah. Why? Why don't what what do you what, what what do you do? You do what you want to do, right? If you're yeah. doing what you want to do, you're saying basically, God, yes, you're big, but I'm no, bigger than no, you. No, no, I won't say that. Oh, you, you don't have to say it. You just have to act it, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> because, but that's what you're saying, gosh. You may not say it in your words, but if you defy God, you're saying you're really not big and that powerful. I will defy I will do my own thing. And that's idolatry. And that's false worship. That's what we're trying to say, okay? So basically what we're trying to say here is... Unless you find contrition, if you f don't find repentance and a recognition that you're smaller than God, you cannot be a disciple. You cannot be part of the army in the cosmic conflict. Because what I'm trying to say is, you sin, you repent, you sin, you repent. You're what is that? Because you're human. Aren't you glad that No, God... what I'm trying to say is, if you're going to do it, why not continue? You know, <laughs> what I'm okay. trying to say is, it's, it's crazy. That's why. Because humans God is crazy love. That's crazy grace. That's why it's amazing grace. Can you imagine if God says, cast 10 more and that's it? <laughs> Man, that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad for you, right? No. I know that. I know that. The promise of the Bible is if we sin, if yeah. we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Will God forgive you a thousand times over when yes. you come to Him? Yes. The only people who will not be forgiven are those who will not ask for forgiveness. Are, are you oh, following? So what's the deception? The deception of the enemy is to say that you're really not a sinner. Because if you're not a sinner, you will not ask for forgiveness and you will not be forgiven. When, when, God, when, when God says, that's it. But you have, you have to quit what you did to, to compress. If you... If you do that and confess and tomorrow you do the same thing, it won't work. Okay. Uh, uh, so I don't want to put you on the spot, Larry. For you. Have you quit or have you been no, doing things I mean, that you have uh, done before? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. He said, he, said, right. he confessed, he was forgiven and do the same thing tomorrow uh -huh. and confess. Okay. Okay. So do I don't want thing. I don't want to put you in the spot anyway. I'll ask this as a general question. How many of us have committed the same mistakes and have gone to God for forgiveness. That is how amazing God's grace is. No, sometimes, sometimes I, uh, I make mistakes. You know, when I make mistakes, it's it's so it's, 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 forgiveness it's no no return anymore. That's that's the deception of the enemy. That's the deception of the enemy. The enemy, the great controversy saying there is no limit to the grace of God as long as you come to Him. Well, I hope so. You don't have to hope so. That's the promise. You just have to believe it. If you don't, uh, what, what does Jim McDonald say? Jim McDonald says, it's time for us not to just be Bible reading Christians. We should be Bible doing Christians, right? If the Bible says, he who comes to me, I will not cast out. If you confess, you say, I'll do it. Go to him and confess to him every day. He will get forgiveness. Our faith is about his faith. His faith. He had faith to go to the cross to fulfill all this, and that's where I. But I don't have that faith kind of faith, you know. Sometimes you, yeah. you know, just you well, just. So, Cass, that's why you have to pray, because then he will enable you to believe. That's why he said, "Help me." No, I, I, I believe, believe, but sometimes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. That's yes, right. It is. right. That's why, you know, it's been how many years now, guys? You were planning to be rebaptized. Maybe that's what you need to do. When you're rebaptized, maybe you will have, you will have this faith. Yeah. But you cannot be confessing the same thing every day, according to Matthew Henry. Why not? You, you confess for the like, uh, cheating. Tomorrow you cheat again. Then okay. You confess. Tomorrow cheat. okay, so Larry, I'll really put you on the spot now. But okay, you okay, you you cheated somehow uh, an intentional day and you confess God forgave you. That means you cannot cheat anymore because if you cheat he will not forgive you anymore. No, but you have to no, you answer my question. Will he not forgive you anymore if you confess that you cheated again? Yeah, yeah, yeah but you have to stop what you have been doing. That's why when, they, when Christ said to the woman, go and sin 
No more. Uh, that's not. That's not the question. Is not yeah. your your attitude of trying to stop. But this, it, what is the reality in the scriptures? Will you still be doing things that you've done wrong? Yeah. And that's the reality of the Bible is you can do it 70 times, 7 times, and God will come back to you and still forgive you. That's the scandal of the gospel. And I, 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 I praise God that that's a scandal of the gospel. That regardless of what I have done, I can never stoop so low that the grace of God cannot take me back. Matthew yeah. 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 Uh, come as you are. We are very okay. You come today to the church. Fortunate tomorrow to you are still God. doing the same thing. He said, don't smoke. Here. Yeah. But tomorrow yeah. you are still yeah. smoking. And then every day, every day. So Matthew Henry say, there will be a time that God will not hear what you are praying. Because even the prayer of a uh, simple man okay. is abominable to him. Okay, so I'll follow your line of thought. So that's what Matthew Henry says. When will that time come where, where, you, where you will not when you learn to get forgiveness anymore? I will tell you. I'll suggest to you what, when that comes. Because if you keep on doing the thing that you're doing, one of these days you will realize, you will tell yourself, what I'm doing is not really wrong. Okay, let me finish. The moment you say what I'm doing is not really wrong, you will not ask for forgiveness for what you're doing. And that's the problem. But as soon, as long as you keep on coming to God and asking for forgiveness, the promise of the Bible is He will forgive you of your sins. But if you are coming of the same thing, look at the Old Testament uh, people that uh, happens. Mm -hmm. You saw them in Gomorrah, all of those that happen. Mm -hmm. When they come to rent and they do say the same thing, time is coming that the, the wrath of God will be falling upon them. Sure, I understand that. Uh, but I always ask this. And uh, I did not include it in my sermon. Uh, Abraham bargained with God, beginning with 50, went to 45, 40, right? All the way to 10. So Tim Keller asked the question, what if Abraham bargained with God and said, please forgive me, Lord, but what if there were two in Sodom and Gomorrah? Will you spare the city? Do you think God will spare the city for two if Abraham asked for two? But he still... Answer my question first, Larry. Don't jump into another No, talk. there is but, a boundary line. No, no, no. You answer look, my question. Look we'll, what happened to the, the northern and the southern okay, kingdom. You are not, you, we're, don't go to the north. Let's go to Sodom and Gomorrah. If God said, if Abraham told God, if there were two, would God have spared the city? Yes. Yep. Okay, may, let me rephrase the question. Yep. Is there a limit that you can put to the grace of God? Okay, that's my point. That's the point. That's why it's called eternal grace, amazing grace, infinite grace. The only reason why you will be lost is that you do not avail of that grace. And the only reason why Matthew Henry said that is if you keep on sinning and sinning again, that sin one of these days will no longer be sin to you. And once it does, it's no longer sin to you, you will not come to God and ask for forgiveness. And because you don't ask for forgiveness anymore, that comes to your close of probation. He's going to reject you. But as long as you keep on coming back to God, He will forgive you. The bottom line is the only difference between a true Christian okay, and, and an unbeliever is this. When you sin, you hate what you're doing. But you can do it a thousand times, but you will hate what you're doing a thousand times and you will come back to God. And the biggest, biggest danger is if you don't hate what you're doing. And you know what John MacArthur says? If you're sinning and you don't hate what you're doing, you probably are not safe. And that is what the new uh, accompanying book of Next Quarter, that is what they call him a, a cheap grace. Okay, before, before you go to the next quarter, <laughs> no, uh, did, I mean, did you catch the last thing I told you? What I mean, <laughs> okay, all right. what I mean you coming to, the, to God to face of the same uh, thing every day, according to him, that is a cheap grace. Cheap grace is just uh, immense, immense. Okay, well, let me just, let me just resolve. Bible, let's resolve what... Those, let's re those terms are not seen in the Bible. You cannot read those words let, in the Bible. Let's, let's resolve what... Let's resolve what Larry basically said. If, if, you can, if you come to God again and again, and the promise of God is He's going to forgive you, will there be a limit to the number of times God will forgive you? The Bible doesn't say so. Okay, see, see, you try to answer my questions for Larry. We will I'll never... give you an example. Okay. You preach the gospel. Uh -huh. You baptize the person. Why? Okay. Because there was a change. Okay. Those... No, you confess the sin today and tomorrow you do the same thing. 
There is no chains. Okay. Yeah. There must be a chain. Uh, all right, all right. Okay. Let's talk from the Bible. No, no, no. What the Bible says. Yes, okay. What is the together. change that happens when you are saved? You tell me what the change. Is it the change of behavior or a change of your heart? No, no, he, he, he Answer my question, Larry. We will never get done. Is it the change of your behavior or a change of your heart? Can you say, oh, this guy is no longer worshiping on the Sunday. He's worshiping on the seventh day. Is he saved because he's worshiping on the Sabbath day? The Pharisees worship on the Sabbath day. A lot of them. And they, they followed all the rituals and so many laws in the Sabbath. What did Jesus say? Unless you exceed the righteousness, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's not the external obedience that saves you. What is the change? What is the new covenant about? The law will be written where? It will be written on your heart. And the fact that that law is written in your heart, whenever you sin, you are not violating the law anymore. You are, yeah. you are hurting the heart of the lawgiver. Changing and, your heart, okay. your behavior will, will explain how your child changed. Yes. Yeah, that is the behavior. Okay. That is the, the change of the heart. What was the behavior of Paul in Romans 7? Which one? The good which I don't want to do. The good which I want to do, I cannot do. The evil which I cannot do, that I do. Paul was saying when he was converted, he said this. He wanted to do something, okay, but he cannot do it. The thing that he doesn't want to do, that what he does because there is an evil nature within him. Okay. Question, why did Paul hate sin? Because he is saved. This doesn't mean because he hates sin, he doesn't sin anymore. No, the difference is that he hates sin. Before he was saved, he did not hate sin. He loves sin. And that's my contention. If you are sinning again and again because you love doing it, you are not saved. But if you sin and you hate what you're doing, but regard because of your weakness, you do it again, but you hate what you're doing, you are saved and God will keep on giving the grace of God to you. That is where comes the, mm -hmm. the aid of the Holy Spirit. But that mm -hmm. you is the, whole, mm -hmm. the, uh, the aid of the Holy Spirit, He stop you what you are doing. You confess today and tomorrow because you are not going to confess, do the same thing. If you do that every day, mm -hmm. Okay, but this is what God said, okay? Just my opinion. Let us reason together. Okay. Let's say something. Grace is, uh, you know, you just, uh, I can do my own thing. Anyway, God will forgive me. But yours is like, you ask forgiveness and you sin again. Ask forgiveness, sin again. As long as he would ask forgiveness, that's good. Because eventually he'll feel guilty, he'll stop. But it would take many, many, many times of sinning, mm. same sin. Not like if you stop, uh, you, you stop for asking forgiveness, so you just go on with your sin and go on without asking forgiveness. Then there's no way right. that you can but change. Is that that's the but same that, way you say that I could just go on with my life and who, I'll just ask for forgiveness every day. Okay, and that, yes. uh, and God will forgive you because but, that's but what that, He promised. But if I was a true believer, I wouldn't go on. I I would. Like, ex exactly, exactly. And then, and, and, no, we're already jumping to the next quarter. Okay, let me just summarize it. Let me, let me just summarize it. In. One more question before okay. you go. Before I have about go. five minutes. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no more questions. Okay, just one more question. Okay. <laughs> this is the last one. Okay. At the time of Moses. Uh -huh. When was it? Uh, he was uh, Moses was coming from the Mount of Sinai. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, the, the two, bells, two tables of stuff, the tablets of stuff. And uh, the people of God uh -huh. is doing something the wrong. The golden calf. Yeah. Uh -huh. They didn't. They didn't uh, give him a chance to when he when he he threw the uh, it must the uh, uh, the, 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 the people. Mm -hmm. What the people of the people that who is doing that they don't have any more chance. That's right. Yeah, I mean, and that, that's really. No, the, they don't have. They don't have uh, the. They don't have to. Okay. What I mean. What I mean. Yes, they, I, they don't I have the time. Have the time to. Yes. To well, I, that's not really true. Did Did they see how God sent the ten plagues in Egypt and how they crossed the Red Sea, and no, how no, they no, crossed no. the I Jordan? Mean, on, on the time that when. Uh, yes, but I mean, were they given enough chance to see the power of God all along? Yeah, but what? Why I, did they grow dance against the golden gold, golden calf? They, they know that they're, they're a God that parted the Red Sea for them and killed Pharaoh's armies and ten plagues. Well, you know, the, uh, it's because just like Aaron the, part of the group. Ask forgiveness and sin again. No. Ask forgiveness and sin no, again. No, they never believed God. They just, they just well, went. How well, do you know that? They, they, because the fact that they were worshipping Bay and they were worshipping the golden calf, they did not believe Yahweh. They believed the golden calf. 
Made by not, not everybody believed the golden calf. A lot of people were left to, to believe in God. But some people who were persistent in their, their idolatry, they never believe in Yahweh. They just believe in what they had in Egypt. Okay? You got to understand, there's a great controversy there of worship again. The bottom line, that's what I want to see. Uh, let me summarize it. Cheap grace, okay? Cheap grace is saying that you're saved even if you do not hate sin. If I want to put it that way. Because a lot of people in America today, what over 50% of Americans say they claim that they're born-again Christians. But they never care to read the Bible, go to church, or pray. That is cheap grace. Well, you I'm proclaim sure. to the world that you're saved, but you do not care about God. Your heart is not in God, and you say that you are saved. Are you following? And there's no way you can be saved in the Bible because the new covenant is a change of heart. And unless your heart is changed by the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. And anybody who has a change of heart will not persistently and intentionally sin. They may sin, but they will hate what they'll do. And the promise of God is every time you confess your sin and you come yeah. back to me, I will forgive you. That's different than a lot of people. Yeah. Yes, right. That's why Peter said, oh, am I great? I will forgive my brother three times. No, seven times. Because according to the writings of the Jews, if I forgive him three times, I'm already perfect. No, I'll make it seven times. What did Jesus say? No. Seventy times seven. Jesus said, if you want to know the grace of God, it never ends. The bottom line is it begins with your heart. Okay? That's why, remember the question I had? There was this, uh, this man who was an elder in the church in Loma Linda, and Dr. Provence visited, and they also visited Dr. because he became senile. And you know when you become senile, you can say a lot of things which you don't want to say. So they go inside the clinic of Dr. Provence, one of the leaders of the Adventist church in Loma Linda. And when they sat down, out of the mouth of this church elder came the foulest words that you can think of, and the dirtiest jokes. And then the woman said, I'm, I'm Pastor Provencio, please forgive me. He becomes like that every so often when he's not in his right mind. You think that person will be saved? God will be yeah. the one to determine it. Well, that's the point. That's the point. Because in his heart, before he went to the senility and before what happened to him in his heart, he was saved by God. And that's what Provencio said. Don't worry about it. I know it's not him. I know his heart. I knew him. He knew the Lord. But the fact that the physical ailment comes to you, makes funny things in your head, you do funny things, that doesn't mean you're... See, and sometimes, let me, let, let, me, let me be very frank with you. Don't you think some people in the church sometimes look at you and tell you, Huh? He's a member of this church. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, he, he happens that, okay, aren't you glad, aren't you glad that God looks at your heart? And you know how freeing it is when you go to church. You don't worry about what people tell. Yeah, you don't. You, you don't. You don't care what people say about you. All you care about is what people, what God says about you. That's why when the question has been asked. Well, because because you cannot hear what is saying God, God to you. That's what I'm. Well, I'm telling you, Cass. If you, if what's more important, what's most important to you is God's opinion of you, you will have no problem. You will come to a point where you will have no problem with what other people say. Who and that's, that's Christian maturity. Who is Terry, huh? Well, so, I mean, you don't even have to say that there. Okay, the, the bottom line is, that's why when people ask me, how do you know if you're safe? You know a really nice answer? You ask my God. Because my God knows I am safe. That's a very difficult statement to controvert, right? You cannot contradict that because, hey, God knows I'm safe, and I know Him. Yes. He knows that I am safe. You know, that's part of the great controversy in our minds. Yes, exactly. The Armageddon and the conflict really doesn't happen in this turf. It happens here. And what happens here? And we'll go back to what Larry raises up. What is your attitude towards sin and attitude towards worship? And if I was a true, say, a true believer the perseverance of the saints, I would have that ongoing desire. Sure. Sure, and that that desire sometimes may not may, may be in contradistinction with your behavior because that's the way we are. But as long as the desire is there, that desire will keep on coming back to God. What did Ellen White say? Ellen White says, the angel, the, the Satan and his demons 
tremble when the weakest saint is on his knees. You know what the weakest saint means? You go to our church, look for the weakest member. What's the meaning of a weakest member? The baddest dude. <laughs> the baddest dude you have in there. In other words, if, if there's any member of the church who does all things that's really nasty and bad, he's the guy. You know what that, that's where the prophecy says? When that guy kneels down, Satan and his demons tremble. Because there's power when you kneel down. There's power when you become contrite. Which means I got four more <laughs> about to change. The next part is communion. But Jesus basically just said, Hey, before you even go out, spend time with me. I want to be with you first. And that's one of the failures of missions today in evangelism. We spend so much time trying to accomplish things with God. We don't spend time with Him first. Right? I don't have to elaborate with this. If I want to illustrate this, remember the movie The War Room. Okay? The War Room will answer that question to you. The way to do battle in the great controversy is not to tough it out. The, day, the way to do battle is not to change your husband or change your wife. The, day, the way to do battle is bend your knees and surrender to God. And let God win the battle and fight the battle for you. Okay? Uh, Mark 4.40. Everybody has that. I promise we have five minutes and we'll wrap this up. This is a very interesting and exciting study for a cast who has no question. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark 4.40. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Okay, what is the story about? This is a big, big storm, right? Okay. And the water was going into the boat. They were about to sink. And according to the skit, the disciples went, These are seasoned fishermen. Jesus, don't you care? We're going to die. <laughs> and what did Jesus whoosh, whoosh, Quiet. <laughs> Everything began calm. That's what they said. Peace be still. Everything went. Yo, why have you so little faith? I'm with you. Is there anything that you cannot do if I'm with you? That was the question of Jesus. That's why this three goes together. If you're contrite and you know how to come to God and seek for His grace, you'll be welcome into His presence. You will sense the presence of God. And when the presence of God is with you, you are consecrated and there's nothing you cannot do. It says here, how we see that you have no faith. Faith of what? We are, you know, sometimes we are just reading it and then we don't look farther how it is here. Because okay. we must remember, this is the language of heaven translated in the language of men. Okay, so he say, explain to us in our language, uh, Larry. What 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 is what is the faith? Jewish faith. Uh, see, Hebrew. How is it that you have no no faith? Faith of what? Hebrew yeah, faith of what? What so do you understand that? What is the context? In order to understand the Bible, you gotta understand the context. What's the context of that statement? When yeah, did Jesus we, say we that? Have to, to read. Yeah, we no. just said that. Give me they the context apply, in the passage. They did not apply their faith. Okay, don't Hebrew don't faith. give me like this fuffy fuffy. There was a storm. They, they think show. they would die. Even if Jesus were with them, they thought they're gonna die. They cannot bear the storm. I don't know. In why. other words, because the storm was so strong, they lost their faith that even if Jesus were them, the storm didn't matter. That is the context. And that's the point. They, they didn't have the faith of Cedric, Mesach, and Abednego. Yes, okay. And, then other, and the other faith, and the, the other faith, the other faith in Hebrews 11, okay? All we're trying to say, what's the context of the faith? Jesus is basically saying, I am with you, regardless of how big the storm is. If you have faith, you will not be afraid. That is the context. What is that faith? That is the faith, Larry. That's why I brought that, mm. so that we, we, will, we will know what it faith. is all about. Because even though they were with Christ, they lost that with Him, everything right. is okay. and possible. I, and I thought, and we, so just, I thought we just said that. I, th I thought we just said that. You mean, yeah, I, maybe if you mean, well, that's what we're trying to say I in the consecration the here. There is, uh, how, how come they all, they, uh, the, their faith was lost right there away, like, like right away? They forgot they, they were they, Hebrews. They know, they, they know that Jesus is there. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you know, uh, if you are a Christian today, the, the God promises not to leave, never leave us or forsake us. So even now, God is with you. What if somebody points a gun to your head and tell you, if you don't confess, if you keep on confessing Jesus yeah. Christ, I'm going to blast your uh, head? No, because the background of the 12 apostles, 
they are not really 100% convinced until the resurrection. Okay. There are times they say, what kind of man is this? Sure, we can, uh, we, we'll go to that in a little while. No, that's but why... It, no, it was, it was, but even before the resurrection, Peter was able to bring out the Son, the, uh, the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Yeah. So they, 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 they were chosen to be the disciples to learn these traits. And even before the resurrection, these traits was being introduced to them. Because even before the resurrection, they were taught contrition, communion, and consecration. Was there? We, we're reading it from the Bible. Before the resurrection, all of these passages are before the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did they really understand? They did not fully understand until Christ rose from the dead. But in the process of discipleship, they were being taught these qualities, right? And if you want to be a disciple, these are traits you must develop to be part of the winning team in the great controversy. That's what we're trying to say. Okay, so we go to compassion, Matthew 20, 26. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Yes, uh, the, uh, the, the translation is pretty heavy. You read it in another translation, anyone who wants to be great with you should be your servant, right? This is what they call servant leadership. So what is the, what is the teaching here? The teaching is compassion. Compassion, qualities. Matthew 20, 26. The, the story here is that the, 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 mother, the, mothers of, the mother of the brothers were t t asking Jesus, hey, when you come into your kingdom, you know, install this man. Give them a high office. Let, let them sit to your right and to your left. In other words, give, make them vice president or whatever, you, the chairman of whatever the thing. And the disciples got mad. How, how come they alone? We should have positions as well. They have very wrong ambitions. They did not understand the kingdom of God. That's, that's, ex, that's explains what Larry just said. They, they were following Jesus, although they were learning a bunch. They really did not understand what Jesus was about, right? So you must learn compassion. I guess they were taught compassion. Compassion means have the willing, have the heart of service. That's why in the text, in the church. Uh, you got your explanation. I have my, I have when I teach the Habit School lesson, I ask this: What is the one of the primary problem of the twelve apostles? You see, to be number one, who is gonna be the first? That I applied it in here. Yes. Okay. Well. Uh, that's another perspective. I'm trying to say, I'm suggesting that this should be the perspective. If you're, in the, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you must learn the quality of compassion. What the, what's the meaning of being compassionate? When you go to, don't lord it over. Yeah, don't, but don't lord it over the church. Don't wait for people to serve you. Think of ways whereby you can serve your fellow man. And one of the reasons why one of the leading indicators, say Rick Warren, of backsliding is when somebody decides not to attend church anymore. You know why? Because the moment you cease fellowship and you cease attending church, you will have no opportunities of serving your brethren within the church. You follow? Because if you don't attend church, you don't show your face anymore, you will never meet that girl or guy who got sick or had the problems or lost a job who needs your prayer with them, right? That's where compassion is. That's why the disciples were taught to have compassion and a heart of service. And lastly, Luke 24, 27, 32, there was a conviction. What was the conviction? The story is about the disciples going to Emmaus. When they were going to Emmaus, Jesus joins them, right? This is after the resurrection. And what was the story? Why are you so sad and forlorn, says Jesus to the disciples. It said, are you the only one in Israel who didn't know what happened? And they talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, Ravi Zagari says, isn't it ironic that they asked Jesus the question, are you the only one who didn't know what happened in Israel, when in fact he was the only one who actually knew what happened? That was the irony, right? Hey, where, were the, where were the disciples? They were hiding. Because Jesus died. Jesus knew what was going on. And what happened? Jesus explained the whole scriptures pointing to whom? Moses. Pointing to him. Beginning with Moses and the prophet. All the writings in the, the scriptures. He says, all of these writings point to me. What is he trying to say? All the things that has happened is part of the great controversy and part of my victory and triumph over the enemy. That's what he's trying to say here in the context of our quarterly. All right? And what happened in verse 32? 
Remember, uh, they recognized Jesus Christ. Did not our heart burn with us within us while he talked with us by the way? Okay, I mean, but don't don't understand. He said that after he disappeared. Yes, the, 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 yeah, he said that after. He, we'll go back to that a little bit. Well, what? Don't think of this as heartburn, okay? You, you need to buy antacid and Walgreens, okay? Uh, think of this from a different standpoint. When you say somebody's on fire, I'll give you an example. The the most uh, the most uh, what's it called? The most exciting player to follow right now in the NBA, is Steve Steve Curry, right? Uh, he's probably more exciting okay. than Michael Jordan, okay? <clears throat> but the moment Steve Carey connects with those three pointers, you know, one after the other, you, there is expression, oh my, Steve is on fire. Do you get that? What's the meaning of Steve is on fire? He's, his heart is in the groove, he's doing his thing. This is what they meant. That, that, that's that context where you understand, did not our hearts burn within us? Did not we have did not we then we have that fire when Jesus was talking to us because the master was talking to us we were how 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 hot were they they were so hot they ran back and told the disciples that's why it's I call it missions they were so convicted with what happened they had to run back and tell people about Jesus Christ uh, and then you go back to what Benji saying how did they how did they come to un, to recognize Jesus Christ in the spirit Oh, well, they, they disappeared. So he was a ghost, huh? Oh, okay. The eyes were open. Nice, 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 nice stories. Until I, you know, I, I read this so many times, and it finally dawned on me. It's very beautiful. What did the disciples tell you? No, 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 no. Why don't you come in and sup with us, have dinner with us? You know, that's that's Eastern, Middle Eastern hospitality. Okay. And what did they do? When you eat together, you break bread. Who broke the bread? Jesus. Okay, how do you break the bread? So you get the bread, you break it like this. And when I break it like this, I'm breaking it in front of you, what will you see? Is it crumble? Is it crumble? I mean, uh, yeah, you, if, you will, uh, if all you think about is the bread, you will see the crumble of the bread. But if you're thinking of Jesus Christ, you will see the scars in his hands right here. It's the Lord. See, I mean, their eyes were open. How were their eyes open? By Jesus breaking the bread in front of them, he saw, they, he displayed the scars in his arms. And because that happened. Right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, before. He has that divine be power. Yes, before he disappeared, though, yeah. he opened their eyes. How did he open the eyes? I like to put it this way he opened the eyes of the disciples through the cross. Pretty cool. I want to say this. You will only, your eyes will only be open to, to Christian doctrine and biblical doctrine through the cross of Jesus Christ. If you don't understand that doctrine to the cross of Jesus Christ, you will not understand what Jesus is trying to say. Man, they were walking. They knew all about this guy. Well, you're the only one who don't know. In fact, Jesus was walking with them until Jesus said, Whoop, I died for you. It's amazing that uh, not only am I discouraged when I sit down sometimes listen to sermons in other churches, they don't preach from the Bible, they preach from the travelogues. I'm hoping that we'll do their more biblical. But sometimes I sit down with churches, I listen to bi biblical preaching, but they just talk about the Bible. You hardly hear about Jesus Christ in the preaching. Very impressive. They talk about the stories of Samson, stories of the judges. But really, what is preaching? Preaching is a message centered on the cross of Jesus Christ. Because when you preach the word, it will How only have really power. If you're, uh, if you're uh, talking about uh, Samson and Delilah, how can you relate with Jesus Christ there? Yeah. That's why, that's why you, cannot, you cannot hear Jesus Christ when they are sermoning well, those, yeah, uh, really. those people. What kind, were, you, were, you there, were you here when I did the, the lesson on Judges? Oh, he wasn't there. So you, if you weren't here, you probably have known. Okay, what's the? Why? Why did uh, Samson have long hair? Nazarene. He took the Nazarite vow. Was there another person in the New Testament that took the Nazarite vow? Jesus Christ. Oh man, there are so many parallels there, and those are opportunities to preach Jesus Christ. And yeah, people but missed... what I'm trying to say is, you cannot hear the word of Jesus in there. Yeah. Well, that's the point. Unless you are deliberate and intentional when you give a message to center it on the cross. You just, you just, 
relaying the okay. stories of well, Samson point, and Delilah. Point, point taken. In the Old Testament, do you see in the name of Jesus? Yeah. No. You see it in Matthew, <laughs> not in the Old Testament. <laughs> there is a coming Messiah, but there's no name of Jesus. Yeah. 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 But in the in the in the New Te the Old Testament, the uh, the uh, what they call that? Uh, I am. The prophets, uh, they are. They did not mention the name of Jesus. No, they are not there. They say, but exactly. Are, Even if you don't have the name of Jesus, can you still preach about Jesus? Yeah. yeah. That's the point. Okay. The point they're saying is, Jesus is saying, you read all of this. You believe all the prophets are foolish and slow of heart, have you? You read all the prophets, but you missed the point. The missed the point is all of these guys point to me. And you know, all of this is about this. I'm breaking bread with you. All about this, all of this is about me dying for you so I can save you from your sins. If you miss my cross, you will miss the entire Bible. That's what he's trying to say. Aside from that, according to this text, he said what? In beginning at Moses, those enemies of Christ believe on Moses. And why Moses wrote for Christ, they do not like to understand him. That is the very no, essence. They, they, Larry, they, no. they, knew, they knew Moses and they knew the Pentateuch. They knew, in fact, that if you are a true Jew, you can memorize the entire Old Testament. You can say it from memory. The, the way we can never, we can never equal the mastery of the Old Testament with the Jews. What was the failure? John 5, 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but you do not want to come to me and accept me. The failure was not knowing the Old Testament. The failures was no. rejecting Jesus Christ to whom the Old Testament that pointed. That is the same thing. They say, our preacher is saying, okay, mm. I, will, I use the word enemy, enemies of Christ. They believe on what Moses wrote. So we this believe said, on I Moses, am am. and then Moses wrote about Christ, and these enemies of Christ do not believe on Christ. Do you see the analogy here? Yeah. No, I didn't. They the, believe the, in I am, and Jesus Christ yeah. said, I uh, am, I am. God you you, you, you constantly funny. challenge my mind, Larry, okay? <laughs> all, all, I'm, all I'm trying to tell you is, the Old Testament is about Jesus Christ. Yeah. And one of the qualities that Jesus taught the disciple is this. You must have conviction. How will you have that conviction? That conviction can only be brought about by the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, you can read the entire Bible, you can read the entire Old Testament and the New Testament. If you do not center your study in Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus Christ, you will not be convicted. You will not die for Jesus if the cross is not the center of your life. By the time that persecution comes, you'll be the first one to renege and say, yeah, no, 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 I'm, I, you just, just, just spare my life. Just pull the trigger on. Yeah, well, yeah, you can only say pull the trigger if you value the cross of Jesus that much. Oh. And you say, if Jesus loved me so much, what is this life compared to what he has given to me? All right, so let me summarize in, in the in about 30 minutes to we had, Wow, this is the longest. It's long, for uh, an afternoon where Cass doesn't have any questions, wait, wait till I come back here and says, I have a lot of questions. Men will probably take two hours, okay? But. These are the three qualities of the disciples of Jesus, okay? Contrition, communion, and consecration. This, this is the, the study, okay? And then, compassion, which is service, and you have conviction. How do you put this into your head? I'll make it, I'll, I'll repeat what I told uh, uh, Terry earlier. Uh, Martin Luther said in conversions, there are three, three phases of conversions. A conversion of the heart, a conversion of the mind, and a conversion of the purse, or a conversion of the wallet, okay? Unless you have a conversion of the heart, the mind and the wallet, you're not truly converted. Okay, the conversion is not complete. In other words, even your wallet must be converted to God. All right? But if you don't have any wallet, what will you do? Okay, well, what? if you have any wallet, you can only have two mites, like the widow. You can still give everything to God. Okay? <laughs> All right, so one writer said, I want to improve on what Martin Luther said. There is a problem today in the church. The reason why the church is so anemic today as a body, and we don't have a whole lot of impact in culture, is because we do not have a whole picture of conversion. Because there are three aspects of conversion. You are first converted to Christ, by contrition, communion, and consecration. And then you are converted to the church via compassion. And then you are converted to missions. If you have a heart converted to Christ and you love studying about the cross and love studying about the darkness, that's one phase of conversion. You're converted to Jesus Christ. He gives you a new heart. You have a desire for Him. Okay? 
That's one part, what the mention of conversion. The second part of conversion is that once you accept Jesus Christ, you become part of the body or the family of Jesus Christ. You must start caring for the body of Jesus. You must care, start caring for your fellow members in church. That's why the, the statement of Jesus, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of this, my brethren, you have done it unto me. He was not talking about the homeless in Chicago. Yeah. Not that we should not help the homeless. But Jesus is saying, if you are supposed to care for somebody, the first line of defense, the first people you should care for are the people of my body within the church. Learn to care for the church. Get all your gifts and serve the church with whatever you can. Then tell them to the leaders first. Okay. Let's not judge right now, okay? You don't want to end our, our no, studies. No, I'm not judging. I'm yes. just telling you. Yes, yeah, yes. You're, judge, you're, you're judgingly <laughs> telling me. Okay. All right. They, all, all I'm saying, before you can even think of what others are doing, first think what you can do for others, okay? And, and if, if, if people... And, and I don't care what others do, okay? Because if I cared what others do, I would not be doing this anymore. Okay? Okay, you, you think you, it's... You should easy. care for others too okay. also. Oh, that's my point. If you... If you are, if if you if I if you just listen to the reactions of other people, there was a lot of things that you will not do. But if you're converted and you love I your, understand that. Okay, so I'm going to finish my conclusion. Yes, okay, sir. all right, okay, all right. So if you are converted to the church, that means your heart is not only to Christ; it, your heart is also for His people, and you will do whatever you can to serve His people. How does that come? It comes by not forgetting the assembling of ourselves together. Pray together, worship together as much as you can. And when you do that and serve each other with the gifts that He has given you, you can show conversion in the church. Amen. And lastly, a moment you know the cross of Jesus Christ and its power, you run. And out of conviction, you go to mission. Question, why is your Christian life, why is my Christian life anemic sometimes? According to the author, it's anemic because you don't have a balanced view of conversion. You might just be specializing on doctrine and just talking about Christ. That's good. You know the Bible. Question, are you still active in church? Are you serving in church? If you're not serving in church, you might have some problems with your Christian life. It will not be as fulfilling as it is. Okay, some people are so gung-ho on coming to church, worshiping there, doing their thing. But they have no sense of missions. And they don't share the gospel to people who haven't heard. And it will be in balance as well. So the challenge is, if you got these three conversions, you will have a balanced life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it so happens, when I outline this, it didn't come from me, I prayed about this, all five qualities in our lesson for this coming Sabbath fits into the conversion of Christ, the church, and the mission. How does it fit? Based on the study that we have, if you have contrition, communion, and consecration every day, you are converted to Christ. If you have compassion in the church, you're converted to church. If you have conviction to share it to others, you have conversion to mission. That's why Get all the when three. It, when it fine. comes to conviction, <laughs> Roger asked this morning, don't you know that inside the church there are still so many bad ground? <laughs> okay. Because yeah. the person this morning, good, good and bad sure, ground. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so um, uh, in conviction, yeah, I'm trying to put that together here, Larry, with what I'm trying to say. Okay, but the, I hope you're getting the thrust of the lesson. The thrust of the lesson is the great controversy came to earth. Then Jesus formed an army. How did he form an army? He started with 12, right? With the 12. And how did he start with the 12? He taught these guys for three and a half years five traits that's covered by our lesson. These are the five traits of the disciples. Really, the disciples were people who were converted to Jesus Christ. How were they converted? They were converted to Him, they were converted to His church, and they were converted to the mission of the church. So we end with this. I love the way our lesson ended this morning. When you start with Matthew, Matthew says, You shall call His name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God is with us. Ending Matthew in Matthew 28, 29 and 30, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the Father. Lo, I am with you always. Beginning with Matthew, God is with us. Ending of Matthew, I am with you always till the very end of the world. You jump to Hebrews before Revelation. It says, Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why am I a disciple? 
I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ because through the cross of Jesus Christ, He has promised me His ever-abiding presence. And because He has promised me an ever-abiding presence, I win in the cosmic conflict. How do I win? Because if I if I go if I go to MMC, let let me just okay, let me finish this, Larry, case before. If I go to MMC and I go to Chicago and I go to the south side, the territory I do not know, it would be nice to have two MMC champions with me who are mixed martial arts. Okay? And, okay, so you go to Chicago with two mixed martial arts. So you got to go all the bodyguards that you have. Train, especially train. You will have confidence walking even in the south side of Chicago, right? What if you went to the south side of Chicago one night and you're by yourself? Oh boy, problems. But the good news is, in the great controversy, you are never by yourself. Jesus is always with you. And because Jesus is always with you, you're always the winner. That's great news. Right? That's the news. The great news of the cosmic conflict next week. When we talk about the comrades of Jesus Christ. Who are the comrades of Jesus Christ? The disciples of Jesus Christ. Who are the disciples of Jesus Christ? People who he walks with every day. Who he never leaves. Who promise that his presence will be with them. How? The contrition, communion, consecration, compassion, and conviction. You share that with your class. Hopefully you get the good news of the cosmic conflict in there. Hopefully. All right. Let's pray. Dear Father, it was a long discussion, but it was fruitful. We're so thankful that in the cosmic conflict on earth, uh, you've been gracious to pick us as part of your army. Help us not to forget that we are only strong, and we can only be victorious if you remember that you're always with us, because Jesus has won the battle. And if we are with him, we will always be a winner. The Lord, teach us the traits of the disciples. Teach us to come to you and bask in your presence every day. Give us a heart of love and compassion to your people. Teach us where we can serve the church more in whatever gifts you've given to us. And give us a drive and the conviction to go out and share your love to others who still need you, who haven't heard about you. And as the Spirit works these three levels of conversions in our lives, may we find the true joy and experience what it means to be your disciples here on earth as the battle goes on. And when the battle is over, when you come back, may we find the crowns given to us, not for ourselves, but crowns that we will lay at your feet, that we can worship and praise you and thank you until forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.